Hi and welcome to another episode of Project Warhammer. Uh, what we've got in the background are bits of the black coach that I'm hoping to have finished this weekend. So what I'm doing is at the moment, as I get towards getting the night haunts done, and it's like each week I'm just, I've, I've now got several bits of things. I've now got enough models to make a 2000 point army and indeed a little bit over because I want to swap in some units and try different things out. It's a case of just getting them constructed and painted. So the, the black coach hopefully this week, um, it is predominantly black, so it should be fairly straightforward. I sh my laziness should be able to basically make a justification. Well, it's supposed to be the black coach, it's mostly black. And then I realized I did a very strange thing. It's very difficult, in fact, not impossible to see here, but <laughs> the bottom part of the black coach, which is a bit right at the top of this photo, I decided to dry brush very dark brown, so I thought well, that's more woody. And then I'd done that, and then I thought to myself, well, it's the black coach, it's supposed to be sort of black. And if I do the other wooden bit on top of it that's black, it just looks like it's made out of two different bits of wood. So I didn't really think that one th through. I think I'll have to go over black with the rest of it. So I've made myself a little bit of work there, but hopefully not too much. So hopefully this will start to take shape. And as I say, I don't expect to have it done by the weekend, but at the weekend I expect to have it done. And then at the weekend, what I'll also do is to construct another couple of bits and, and, and work from there. Um, what I'm working towards at the moment, again, just trying things out. I expect to chop and change quite a bit. That is the wrong one. Why have I just clicked that? Get rid of that. This is what I'm working on at the moment. So it's still, as I've been talking, if you're watching the other bits in the series, based on three main blocks. Uh, what I'm calling the centre, the left flank and the right flank, though they're not necessarily deployed like that, of course, that all depends on battle plan, opponents, scenery, all the rest of it. But Chain Rasp Horde in the middle with Guardian of Souls and... I've gone for max special characters in this one. There's three special characters you can have as Night Haunt. I've just gone for all of them. Uh, so I went for Kurdos, and um, who'd be fairly decent. He's a fairly decent combat character, but he is slow. So it's not like he could necessarily pick and choose his opponents. Um, Lady Alinda and Spirit Host on the left there with the Mermon Banshees and some Grimgast Reapers. So those would be the ones I'd sort of plan, generally speaking, to deploy in the underworld so that they can teleport somewhere onto the battlefield during turn one, hopefully somewhere useful. And on the right hand side of the faster units, the Hex Race, the Black Coach, my general who's going to be a Knight of Shrouds. Um, <laughs> the old fantasy battle player in me just looks at this army and think, blimey, this is beardy. This would be considered beardy in it. Not only have I got all three special characters, but my general is a Knight of Shrouds, not Lady Alinda, who really, surely, should be the general. Um, but anyway, it doesn't matter. The rules don't... See, that's the thing. In some battle tomes, it'll say, if you've got this character in your army, they are going to be your general, because they're important. Whereas she, who, law-wise, is the head of all Night Haunt, doesn't have to be the leader. So do you know what? I'm not going to make her the leader. <laughs> and Riken or the Grimhaler. So super speedy, one block. Slow as hell, another block, but I'm hoping to hold up something. And not necessarily super speedy, but fast, in between medium speed on the left block, but more specifically, I intend to just plonk them somewhere. So what I was doing, uh, what I'd said is I'm going to get like a couple of battle tomes each month and read through them so that I can familiarise myself with potentially opposing armies. Now... So I've I technically actually got three battle tomes. So I sent off uh, Caradrin Overlords, which was because basically a friend who ultimately I hope to play in Nottingham um, will be playing Caradrin Overlords. So I thought I'd better learn about them. I also got the Maggotkin of Nurgle because I'm quite interested in maybe at some point making an, an army of those anyway. And then I thought to myself, do you know what? Let's just get the Stormcast Eternals stuff as well which I did. Now, just to show off as well, because... <laughs> so, with the Night Taunt and the Stormcast Eternals, as well as a couple of others, I have got, like, special sets where you get the War Scrolls. Obviously, green doesn't really show up on the green screen. Um, that's it for Night Taunt, which you can't really see. I didn't think this through. But, for the Stormcast Eternals, it's like this. Now, if I just try and show them back to back. So, the... Uh, Stormcast Eternal's like twice as thick as it. Um, absolutely huge. And the other thing is this, I can shake it at the moment because I've taken some out for a reason I'll show in a minute. 
but when they're all in, it's rammed. The Night Haunt one, even when they're all in, still shakes about because it doesn't when I first got it because there were cards of tokens in there. Now, the Stormcaster Tunnel came with cards of tokens as well, but they had to be on the outside in the cellophane because there's no room for them inside here. It's jammed. The range of Stormcaster Tunnel is absolutely huge, and I suppose it makes a certain amount of sense. It, without, before I'd even read the battle term, I sort of got the impression that Games Workshop are really pushing Stormcaster Tunnels as an army. Um, you know, they, they've, they've made them very appealing. They're relatively straightforward to paint if you want to do it. Like I can imagine when I do one uh, as a lazy painter, I can look at those and go, yeah, I could do a lazy job of those. You can do a good job as well, of course, but for a lazy painter, they'd be relatively straightforward. It's huge range, huge range. And also quite high points cost per model because each model is brutal, absolutely brutal. And, um, and I suppose that's good as well because it means that you could get a 2,000 point army. I'm guessing I haven't priced up sensible 2,000 point armies, but I'm gonna guess relatively low cost. There's no such thing as low cost these days, is there, for Warhammer stuff, but relatively low cost. So then what I did is I thought to myself, okay, because I was looking through this battle term and I was thinking straight away, with Night Haunt, the main weaknesses would be things like, and I'm not saying I've necessarily made a sensible, you know, Night Haunt army. I don't know that yet. But I could imagine things things that do mortal wounds will be particularly troubling to me because one of the great boons of a Night Haunt army is they have unmodifiable saves. So, you know, when someone rolls to hit, it's okay, you roll to hit. Uh, you know, someone might get a load of dice, your opponent and go, okay, I need fours to hit. Get those out. I need threes to wound. Uh, roll that. And then they'll say, right, there you go. You've got that many saves. Rend minus two. And I will say, I don't care what the rend is. My save is four plus or five plus on the chain rasp pod. Everything else, four plus, unmodifiable. Great. But with a mortal wound, you get no save at all. So it's like, obviously, mortal wounds are bad for anyone because it means they get no save. But with an army that has an unmodifiable save, because that's really good, um, you're obviously paying a points premium on your models for that. And against mortal wounds, you're effectively losing. You've paid the points premium, but you're not getting the benefit. So units that would do a lot of mortal wounds, and I was reading some of these Stormcast Eternals things, I'm thinking there's a fair few, not loads, I'm not saying every month, but there's a fair amount of stuff that will just do mortal wounds. So, and then I looked at it, I think there's an awful lot of units here. There's like half a dozen units or something like that, including characters, that have special bonuses against something like uh, either Chaos Armies or Death Armies or sometimes specifically Night Haunt Armies. And I'm thinking, bloody hell. That's a lot. And that's not even taking into account items and stuff like that. Because uh, I was thinking my Nighthorn army, um, out of all the units, again, not counting magic items or anything like that, the Spirit Torment, which is a hero character, for example, that gets ability. It's quite a nice ability. If I cause three wounds of damage in any turn, it's a battle shock phase, which can be mine or my opponent's. If I've done in that turn three wounds of damage as an army, not that Spirit Torment, as an army, anywhere, then I can replenish D3 wounds on a nearby night haunt, friendly Night Haunt unit. But if those wounds are done against Stormcast Eternals, it's just straight up three. So that's a nice little bonus. Um, it's not necessarily, because I might have rolled to do three anyway, so it's not necessarily a, a definite up. The bonuses for this are more severe and are pretty nasty. And the fact that some of them will have those bonuses against Chaos or death means that's basically surely a lot of armies. So there's an awful lot. I was looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, this looks horrendous, but at the same time, I don't want to be drawn into the trap of, because I've spent so much time reading about Night Haunts and, and trying to make an army list for Night Haunts, inevitably seeing all the strengths of other armies and thinking, oh my God, how overpowered. So I thought, right, okay, let's look at an army so i tried to look up some results from a recent tournament and i found unfortunately not an official games workshop one what i was hoping for was a list of results now it does have because it has screen it has photos of them but the actual final rankings this is from april 2018 so this is quite recent this is the heat 2 results at warhammer world i believe and it, it goes through like the, the full list. It goes right down to person number 91. That's not as many people. 
as you used to go into the fantasy battle once. I don't know what that's about. But anyway, the point is, on the list, unfortunately, it tells you the person's name, but it doesn't tell you what army they played. So I was hoping to use it to try and work out which armies are mostly taken, because that's another thing to try and bear in mind. But what it did usefully contain was the top three positions with their rosters. So the person who won was a Nurgle army. The person who came second was a Stormcast army. And then the person who came through was a Caradron Overlord's army. So I was looking at the second place. So I looked at the, the roster, because I, again, couldn't listen. Now, Lord Celestunt on Star Drake. Now, I straight away clocked that a Star Drake would be a useful thing to have. They're hugely expensive, massively, hideously expensive. But they have an a bit like the one that I obviously picked up. Anything that's going to have mortal wounds in it. Basically, anything that has mortal wounds. Anything that has a bonus against flying things. Ironically, the other army, the Cadrian Overlords, you can have bonuses against flying units. Now, when your whole army flies, you know, it's basically like, oh. So you can basically half my movement or something horrible like that. But anyway, looking at this one, the Star Drake. So you can call down a rain of stars, pick up to D6 enemy units on the battlefield. So you probably say an average of three or four. Um, roll a die for each unit you pick. On a four plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. And it's anywhere on the battlefield. So I'm thinking, blimey, on average, that's like potentially a couple of units that you can do that with. Now, there's a few other units, not necessarily in this army, that I've seen can do similar things, but maybe it's got a range. I'm thinking, blimey, it only takes, like, three units like this, or characters or whatever, to be able to do D3 mortal wounds on something at range, even if with some of them you have to be able to see it. And you could kill a hero character. Just, I mean, I do have, as Nighthorn, a six-plus ward, well, what used to be called a ward save, special save against that. But that's not... I'm thinking, shit, he could just assassinate a load of things. Um, but nonetheless, the idea that someone would take something on the Star Drake, because I was looking at... There's another one that's a bit cheaper as well, a, a Templar, Drake Templar or something. But yeah, they look very useful. Because the good thing about these, because it can fly, its movement depends on how many wounds it's suffered, so it gets slow as it's wounded more. But it's initially got a 12-inch movement. It's something that's quite powerful and, and you'd want to get it into combat. I don't, you wouldn't want to just sit it back in a corner just relying on those mortal wounds, of course. You'd want to really get it in there. But at the same time, um, you can avoid... If I have something, I say, right, because what I would work out, I'd work out that's dangerous, I want to take care of it. So I'd work out which of my units I have a good chance of mugging it with. Well, because it can fly, I mean, I can fly, but because it can fly and, before I've wounded it, can do... I don't have a lot of stuff to wound it at range. I've got some, well, mostly magic. Um, but they've got a lot of stuff that can frustrate magic. I don't know whether this person took them yet. And I'd be thinking, they could easily avoid me. They could avoid me without hiding. They can avoid me and take on other things. Because it's got the movement speed, as well as the ability to fly, to just avoid me. Um... So that would be quite tricky. So one of my, I was thinking, one of my specific things that I want to plan in advance for the tournament is how would I deal with a unit like this? Because this is what I want to read the battle terms for. Not only to have a look at armies in general, and I'm delighted I found this uh, site, and I'll say who it is, AOS Short. So I know I've looked at this person on Twitter as well. Um, absolutely delighted that this has been put up. Because it lets me see sort of what sort of general armies, what sort of strengths am I going to become against, and how will my army cope? And, and quite frankly, if I'm looking at armies that are doing well in these tournaments, and, and I'm looking at my army and I think, well, I don't think it would do very well at all, then, you know, that's what I want to change. Um, then it had, let's just go down to the roster again. So that was a Lord Celestant on Star Drake, which sounds quite fancy. You'd think that'd be a wizard, but it's not a wizard. Um, you know, so you've got a number of abilities. I mean, it's one big foldy one, so loads of abilities there. Then another Lord Celestin, which is just seen to be on foot. Um, so that's just a, you know, a fighty hero, as far as I can tell. Knight Venator, which looks a bit shooty. Has something with a 30-inch range, three attacks with a, a ranged weapon. So that looks pretty decent. I'm not going to read all the individual bits of it. But what I'm... I mean, this is the this is why I like these War Scroll cards. It's a shame that they only seem to be relatively limited edition. Like, you know, 
you can only seem to be able to get them for the battle tomes that seem to have come out most recently, suggesting that maybe, I don't know, maybe they never existed for the earlier battle tomes. Maybe they've only just started doing it, or maybe they did do them for those, but they were limited print run and they don't do them, you know, if you didn't buy them before they run out, which is a shame because they're, they're so, I found these so useful for just getting some units out and just spreading them out on the bed when I, you know, having a lay down or something. And just and just looking through them and planning things out, uh, they're absolutely amazing. So the few characters here, I'm not really. I mean, this one's a priest, which can do some sort of healy stuff. It's a huge range of, of characters and normal units. Um, but what I'm finding interesting is, so that's basically all the characters, and none of them are wizards, unless I've missed something. No, none of them are wizards, because I was thinking to myself, see, I I quite like the idea. With magic, I don't see. I still don't know how important it is to, if you don't want to have magic yourself, to at least be able to frustrate magic. Now I know that there are some characters that are useful for frustrating magic, but actually I don't think the ones they've taken are those ones. Um, and then they've done, you know, liberators, which is your cheap. Well, relative, I say cheap. <laughs> It's like still 20 points a model, but they've got two wounds each because this is the thing with all these. They, you know, the, the basic heroes have five wounds like in a lot of armies, but the bog standard troops all have multiple wounds. Um, it's for the liberators, your bog standard thing. Stick them in the way somewhere. If they get killed, they get killed. But they'll probably they'll probably stand for a bit because two wounds, reasonable save. Got some nice, uh, they can do some nice damage as well. Judicators, which I was definitely looking at getting because you can get those, those a battle line in a Stormcast Eternal Army. And, uh, you know, some having some ranged. I quite like the idea, or I was thinking I quite like the idea of a Stormcast Eternal Army that has quite a bit of range. And then some real monsters of combat with high mobility, such as something on the, the Storm Drake. Is it called Storm Drake? Let's get it right again. Star Drake, sorry. I knew I'd get it wrong. Um, that, you know, could fly with decent movement that can then pick its fights. So range to soften things up, range shooting to soften things up, and then some monsters to go around picking on where you can see weaknesses in the army, enemy army. And I can see that being a tough thing, even with a Nighthawk army, which is, as I say, a unit that can fly completely. Um, potentially tricky because some of this shooting is quite nasty. And then the Fulminators, they look pretty, I mean, they've got five wounds. They're like units, of, but you only get like two of them, like five wounds each. So they're going to be with a three plus save. Pretty hideous as well. So I'm I'm going to have a proper old look through this. Prosecutors that can fly as well. Um, use, I mean, you know, a unit. They've only gone for a unit of three of those. I mean, two wounds each. It's like six wounds worth. But still, I think probably mostly for capture an objective. They've taken javelins, which I was thinking, because I was thinking it's not a huge range, but it's, it's long enough to probably just hold an objective, chuck some stuff at anything that goes near them. And if anything looks like it's going to take them on, Presumably they'll have some way of reinforcing them. Obviously, I didn't watch any of these games. I'm just looking at the roster and the fact that you know these three people did sort of win. This person came second. Um, and I'm going to look down at the roster as well to see how much is based on gen what used to be called generalship score because there's lots of other scores as well. So it says here for this person who came second, a Mr. Mike Callahan, got a total gaming score of 28. Um, then there's a favourite game vote. It's the person who eventually won, although they got a total game score of 30 anyway, so they'd have won by right anyway. So they got four favourite game votes. Poor old Mr. Callahan didn't get any. But, but it's one of those things. That, I remember that because that was... You basically... You can only like pick one person anyway out of the people you played. And although I don't know how many games were involved, it possibly says somewhere... Um, when I last played in a fantasy tournament, it was like six games, you know, so, you know, people were saying you out of the six people I played and you were my favorite. So that's a tricky one to get really favorite army votes. I'm not quite sure how that was judged. Um, they got two for that. So yeah. Um, so there's, I suppose, up to, for the favourite game votes and the favourite army votes, I noticed there's no scores for peripheral things, because when I did it, you had scores for the army, 
you know, mostly it was tick boxes. It was like, you know, are they painted with like three colors on stuff like this? Are the bases textured, stuff like that? Maybe the rules for this is it just has to be that. Maybe the rules are just you will have them painted with at least three colors on. You will have them on textured bases or you will be taking those models out of your army. Uh, maybe that's it. I haven't actually seen the rules of it. Uh, rather than giving points to reward it, they're just straight up saying, well, if you haven't got it, you're not having it. Um, so it's basically, there's, I don't know how many, because I don't know how many games have been played. No way of working it out as far as I can tell either. So either five or six, there's potentially, there's between 10 and 12, basically, points for popularity uh, to a certain extent. And then however many points, I don't know how many points for generalship. But yeah, it's it will be useful. And what I also quite like is, this is the irony, because when I looked at this, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. Because you've got a Nurgle army, okay, who came first, Stormcast Eternal army that came second, Caradron Overlords army that came third, and those are the ones for which we've got rosters here. And those are the three battle teams I got this weekend that I sent off for. It's like spooky, spooky, really. So the aim will very much... Oh, it does actually have a little breakdown. Sorry, I've just seen here. It does have a breakdown on the spreadsheet, copy of a spreadsheet, of which armies went there. So let's have a look at this. So in terms of Grand Allegiances, 21 Death armies, 33 Chaos, 33 Order, and there's a further breakdown here. I can... Hmm. And seven destruction. Now, seven destruction sounds quite a lot, really, even though it sounds way behind the rest, because destruction is basically just green skins and ogres in terms of old armies. There's not really much in it, as far as I can tell. But there is a further breakdown. I'm not going to read all of them out, but just in terms of the ones that have got a decent number, should we say five or more people played that army? So 13 people played a grand host of Nagash army. Seven people pay, played Caradron Overlords. Now, that's quite encouraging because there's, there seems to be different types of Dwarf Army. And this, as Dwarf Armies goes, these Caradron Overlords tend to be, because of their war, flying airships and stuff like that, frigates and stuff, a little bit more mobile, perhaps, than Dwarf Armies traditionally were. You didn't tend to get many Dwarf Armies in fantasy battle tournaments, really because you weren't realistically going to be scoring five or six massacres which is sort of what was needed to win overall now of course you don't have to go with, to you, you want to try and win it's not essential to win because they were not maneuverable <laughs> they were not fast uh, they had plenty of shooting but that often meant that you stood back and shot so yeah it was very difficult to get massacred because could people might if people couldn't re work out how to unlock you then they just play tentatively and you might score a minor victory or you may just draw it. Um, uh, so yeah, you tended to do all right on a fight by like a battle by battle basis, but in terms of your overall score, because you weren't scoring the massacres, you know, a massacre was 20 points, uh, a solid victory was 17 points, a minor victory was 13 points, 10 points for a draw, seven points for a minor loss, three points for a solid loss. And nothing, of course, if you were massacred. So the the difference between, say, a massacre and even a minor victory was seven points different. You add that up over the, so so it is encouraging that not only did a Caradron's Overlord player come third, that there were seven there were a significant number of people playing them. Um so nice that dwarfs get into the action now. Uh 14 Nurgle. So Nurgle's looking pretty tasty, because that's quite specific because the other thing i noticed in the battle terms i've just got this weekend so the stormcast eternals has a huge range massive it's so massive that it's on two different pages um carriage and overlords a very small range now it has quite a lot of customization with these uh i can't remember what they're called now but they have these three types of traits that you can sort of choose and mix and match so they're very customizable in terms of the army bonuses like the battle traits. But in terms of the number of units and the range of units and characters, it's tiny. It's really small. Um, some of them are, you know, some of them are. Uh, but it, it, I think it is fairly customizable. But the Nurgle one, again, 
doesn't have a massive range. So the fact that there's so many people, like Grand Hotel of Nagash, 13 people playing those, huge range, huge range of characters and models. Not as big as Stormcaster Eternals, but still pretty, pretty impressive range. But Nurgle, not so many, but the fact that more people played a Nurgle armor than anything else sort of suggests to me that they're quite strong. <laughs> That's what that suggests to me. There were five Oryks, which I'm guessing are Orcs. So I'm not really up with the latest things as well. It all seems really weird. Like, instead of Elves, it's called Aelfs now. And they just... I don't know what the hell they're doing. Just to just, just to make it something different. But it's baffling. Everyone knows they're Elves. Just call them Elves. So Oryks, I'm guessing are Orcs. The, the, it looks to me... I, I wasn't there when they did this. I wasn't playing when they did this. But it looks to me like they've tried to go okay we want to make our own things now be totally original and no you know none of this copying off tolkien anymore even though that's how it started anyway like everything um and they're just but it's just comical to me it's ridiculous six seraphon which are like the lizard men i don't really know what's wrong with lizard men but you know seraphon okay fine nine stormcast and then five sylvaneth which are like wood elves aren't they and 12 cinch but only you know nine stormcast so that's also quite encouraging because i was in two minds with stormcast i was looking at it and thinking you know not only a typical troops got like two wounds which even if you consider your pain loads more for them because when you're thinking about the cost of a unit think about when you think about how destructive it is of course and how fast it is but also think about how many wounds it's got rather than how many models but there are sometimes benefits in having five models of two wounds than ten models of one wound um, because if you do one wound to a unit with one wound models you've taken one out of the combat that they can't attack back whereas you do one wound in a situation like that you haven't you haven't weakened that unit at all you know if you do another wound yes but until you've done another wound it still gets its full attacks back so uh, so I was looking at that, but then I was also looking at the fact, but let's be honest, those units are expensive. You don't get many models in a Stormcast Eternals army. It's, uh, it's very far from being a Horde army. And in fact, you can actually have very relatively few. But if you add up the number of wounds, I mean, it seems to me that when you make a 2,000 point army, there are Horde armies, you know, I escaped, worked out a Skaven army that had like 140, 150, something like that. But typically it seems to me they seem to have about 100 wounds-ish, give or take 10 or 15, something like that. Um, so you might not have many models, but you'll have plenty of wounds. And and and, and the range as well, it's not just a case of certain units looking very powerful. It's, it's very customizable in what you want it to do. Like, if you want it to make, to frustrate a heavy magic army, you can do that. They've got characters in here that can do that. If you want to make a very magic heavy army, a very destructive magic, you can do that. If you want to make a highly mobile army, you can do that. If you want to make a very shooty defensive army, you can do that. You, you, there's all sorts of things you can do. It doesn't really, as far as I can tell, have a thing. It's, it's like being all things to all people, which again, I suppose, potentially links in with the idea that it's basically everywhere. You know, It is the army of Age of Sigma. So I am surprised that there's as few as nine people playing it. Now, I don't know why that would be maybe again i just got this oh my god look how powerful they are because i was reading it and thinking with my knight's haunt army i would uh i i fear but then maybe i'm over egging it and and failing to take account of the fact that with so few models maybe i'd be able to overrun certain parts and my maneuverability because let's not forget i can still fly um you know i've still got decent movement and you know I could still potentially... Uh, mind you, they can do the same thing as well. They can do the deep strike stuff as well. But I also look at this thing, and I look at Nighthorn. There was one person brought a Nighthorn to army. Now, this was April, to be fair, and what might count for it is the fact that the Nighthorn Battle Tome only came out more recently than that, because I got it when that came out. Um, so it could be that the rules for Nighthorn were a bit vaguer, you know, a bit iffy because the, the the proper rules for it hadn't come out 
and the models available also maybe fewer. So it would be interesting to note with the tournaments next year if something might change with that. But it was interesting to me that Stormcast Eternals are not... There weren't as many taken as one might expect. But again, I also don't know, because it's since April that I've been getting back into it, I don't even know uh, what the rules were like then. Did this Stormcast Eternals battle term come out since then? So, you know, were they more limited then? I don't know. But anyway, that's just the end of my rambling on it. I was just looking at... Uh, I Just looking at the sort of armies that can come up with the intention of, like, with battle terms. So now that I can see, for example, so Grand Host of Nagash was very popular there. I've already got the battle term for that. That's great. Carriage and Overlord, got the battle term for them. Uh, Nurgle, I've got the battle term for them. Stormcast, got the battle term for them. Siege, don't. I have no intention of playing the Siege army. Uh, out of all the Chaos powers, I dislike Siege. I actually actively dislike Siege. I don't know why either. It's not that I dislike magic. I actually really like heavy magic armies. But somehow, and I've never understood why, I just don't like Siege. Um, and somehow, and I don't know why, I really love Slanesh. I always really try and go with Slanesh. Even though, you know, I like Nurgle, I like Corn as well. Never got on with Siege. So that'll be a classic case of I'll get the battle tone for it at some point to read through it because it seems popular. But I have no intention of ever making a Siege army at all. Uh, in terms of other ones, Seraphon seems reasonably popular, so I ought to get that. Sylvaneth. I've seen some battle reports of Sylvaneth. In fact, they can do some very funny things. So I definitely want to get the battle team for that at some point. Again, just to read about what trickery they can come up with. Um, to, because they do the things with the woods. And so, just like wood elves used to do. Like, oh, I'm going to plonk a wood there. Nice, thanks. <laughs> um, so... Uh, so yeah, I ought to certainly get the battle terms for the more popular ones first. Because my intention is to get all of them at some point. But if I get the ones that I know are the most popular first, then I've got the longest time to really get to grips with them. Try and work out their strengths and weaknesses so that I can quickly, hopefully, identify the strengths and what I can do about it and their weaknesses in order to go straight for the jugular. So anyway, thanks for listening. Uh, any comments, any advice, obviously down below as usual. Hopefully, I'll be able to update with uh, a black coach, Dawn, and uh, some news as well as to how I'm going to be eventually transporting them. The aim is that I fully expect that in about a month's time, I will have the 2,000-point army all done and painted. And, and hopefully, well, I'm quite sure I'll be able to find people to play with them. Um, and we will see what sort of reports I'm able to do. In the first instance, it's probably going to be like largely verbal but hopefully I'll be able to also take a few photos to begin with and maybe even film at some point as well. But I don't know about that, but that is the aim. So thanks very much for listening anyway. If you've enjoyed it, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and share for further content. Don't forget, by the way, if you're just finding these, to check out the series I've been doing on strategizing for these sort of games. So I've been doing my Sun Tzu's Art of Warhammer. And uh, so check that series out as well. And until next time, I'll see you later.